Dear Mr. Vernon, we accept the fact that we had to sacrifice a whole Saturday in detention for whatever it was we did wrong. What we, what we did was wrong, but we think you're crazy to make us write an essay telling you who we think we are. What, what do you care? You see us as you want to see us, in the simplest terms. In the most convenient definitions, you see us as a brain, an athlete, a basket case, a princess, and a criminal. Correct? That's the way we saw each other at 7 this morning. We were brainwashed. Aha, uh-huh. look at you picking one of these iconic ones. I actually want to do my next episode of um, I've Always Wanted to Watch That with this as I watch uh, Breakfast Club with my nephew. So it's fun to hear you nice. read that one. <laughs> I figured I'd give you a, a, a softball. There you go, yeah. First time um, in, that in total, 80 episodes. Totally, <laughs> totally nothing to do with I was having a hard time finding a quote to fit my criteria of how I normally do the quotes. Clipcast is Justin. And I'm Joey. In this episode, we are grooving with one fun and retro battle for love as we get our popcorn out for Scott Pilgrim vs. the World, but then prepare for Lars von Trier to piss all over that popcorn as we bid farewell to one of the podcast's most polarizing directors as we chat about Breaking the Waves from 1996. And just as a heads up, we do discuss our full thoughts on film, so if you've not seen a movie, just skip forward to avoid any spoilers. If you want to be a part of the Movie Club cast, we'd love to hear from you. Email us, follow us, hit that bell notification, you know, do what you do. Or, um, I guess, leave a comment on the podcast. Um, you still on Buzzsprout? Oh, yeah, I met on Buzzsprout in... A hot minute we went to anchor which is now merged with spotify so oh, okay. it's yeah spotify so we should you should just be able to find us on youtube spotify apple and probably a couple of other platforms i'm not 100 percent sure how that works now actually since anchor became spotify for podcasters okay let's talk about some movies with what we've been watching lately with the good the bad and the ugly Excuse me. I've got a bit of a theme going on for me. Uh, I see that. Long before comic book movies hit their stride, uh, long but great and a long way off from being a good movie. <laughs> Am I right? Hmm. I guess we'll see. Like, like one of the movies on this podcast. <laughs> I couldn't resist. I'm sorry. Um, I have mid mobsters trying to be Kurosawa and what the fuck. Huh. All right. So what's your trying to be Kurosawa movie? All right. So that is. Um, so I have a friend. Um, she used to work with me at Rivals, and she's really big into action movies. And I've really gotten her into like a bunch, like just a bunch of action movies she had never seen, uh, a bunch of Asian stuff and like Kill Bill and all sorts of shit. And um, she came over the other day. She actually watched Scott Pilgrim when I watched Scott Pilgrim and we decided to double feature and she was like, Ooh, I won't, I haven't seen a samurai movie yet. So I was like, all right, we're going 13 assassins. 
So, and that is Takashi Miike's I Want to Be Seven Samurai. I mean, obviously, uh, a little bit more samurais and, you know, the one random uh, random guy they found in the forest. It's been a long time since I've seen this, probably like like early Letterbox days. Maybe it didn't even have a review. I can't remember. Um, we did Eat You the Killer like for a lot the of... podcast, right? Huh? We did Eat You the Killer you for the, the kill- podcast. Yeah, we did Ichi. I'm talking about 13 Assassins. I know, but same director, right? I believe so. I believe that is correct, yes. Okay. <laughs> okay. Yeah, and he's done... He did Shiryaki, Western Django, and um, one of your movies that you like very much, Audition, which oh, yeah. is for good reason. I, I really like that movie, and he did <laughs> Dead or Alive. Not the fighting game movie Dead or Alive in America, but a different movie called Dead or Alive. Um... <laughs> A whole trilogy and a bunch of other shit. He he has a humongous uh, library, but um, like a lot of Japanese movies, it throws a ton of characters at you at the beginning. It's like good fucking luck, remember them all, go, and then it's, you know this build up until the the crazy big fight scene at the end. It's a very good uh, samurai movie in my opinion. Definitely worth checking out. All right, um. Let's start off with the long way off from being a good movie. All right, so um, I think I might have mentioned Bad News Bears last time I was uh, we were podcasting, uh, but I finally got to those Bad News Bears sequels. The first one, uh, Breaking Training, not not as good as the first one, but not too bad. I mean, some decent baseball action. But what I want to talk about is the Bad News Bears go to Japan. That's a movie, a very misguided movie. Yeah, this is the the late 70s, so yeah, PC and being like not making fun of Japanese culture was like not quite a thing yet. Um, I mean, this is how misguided this movie is. It's actually like the opening scene is like the boys watching a uh, like a World War II movie like with the American soldiers in Japan and they have this like whole vibe of, you know, they're going to steal back uh, America's pastime from the Japanese. So kind of some strange hostility going on break out my notes for this one it's already already fading from memory did you realize the bad news bears went to japan no (laughs) i also thought those were like 80s movies i guess for some reason maybe i just knew they were 70s and wasn't thinking about it but but yeah that's um true or false all three of these movies include the n-word true and, yep, that's the case. It's a really, I mean, really awkward movie. Uh, okay. I mean, all of them are awkward, but it's especially bad in this last one. What are you saying? I was going to say, I don't think you would have asked me that question if, it, if they weren't in all three of them. Exactly. Aren't these, these are, this is about a little league baseball team, right? Yeah, like the first one, there's this little blonde kid named Tanner. Like, he's bitching about the, the girl joining the team. So, and he, and he calls out uh, Hispanics and blacks as. You know, their um, their uh, ethnic slur, and um, mm. then they do, and then he met, and then he drops basically the same one in the sequel. Whenever they uh, the Italian kid joins the team, and then um, then the black kid actually says it in this last one. Whenever he f- oh yeah, so um, Tony Curtis from um, Some Like It Hot is like the star of this movie. He's like this. This crooked um, promoter, and he sees that the Bad News Bears want to go, or the Bears want to go to Japan, and and so he uh, hooks them up with basically charged up credit cards, so that they're staying in Japan half the movie, like with no money. Doesn't make a whole lot of sense. Um, the end's kind of stupid because it's all about like getting people to promote this game, and uh, it's just so many bad choices there's a big chunk where like the cool kid that rides around on the motorcycle is chasing after like the first pretty japanese girl he meets so um yeah this is a fascinating hour and a half movie there's a lot going on in it i mean there's not a dull moment but it's it's really very strange how this all came together so wouldn't recommend that definitely sounds like a you know product of its time kind of thing oh for sure all right, what you got next for me? How about what the fuck? I think you know what this is because you sent me a message after my review on Letterbox. Huh? French movie. 
Uh, it's Titan. Oh yes, Bro, what yeah, the, fuck? the car fuck, the car fucking movie. Yeah, yeah, and you, the way it's easy, the way you said it, it makes it sound like cars fucking, like it could be some weird, misguided an, uh, porno attempt at the m- cars world. No, no, <laughs> no. This is like if the car from Christine got rapey instead of murdery, mm-hmm. and then fucked a chick, and impregnated her. And mm-hmm. then she tried, because she was also a random fucking serial killer, she tried to hot disguise herself as a missing child from like 10 years previous. And like... Was such a warm relationship yeah. with the father guy, right? Firefighter. He's a firefighter. Yeah, was so fucking, yeah, he was a firefighter. No, it was fucking weird. It was fucking weird. All that movie is weird. Like... What you gotta understand is it's a metaphor. For what? <laughs> I don't remember. <laughs> Is it a, a metaphor for not being able to have an abortion? Because, you know, she tries to self-abort and can't because her womb's encased in fucking steel because she had sex with a goddamn car. That's the thing that happens in this movie. Titan. Yeah. Playing, it's, streaming it's near fucking, you. It, it's fucking weird, and if you want to watch something weird, I guess go for it, but, like, Bro, like, I just there are better weird French movies. You want to see a French movie that has an importance to do with cars? Kind of watch Inside. <laughs> but but Joey won the Palm Door. I don't give a fuck. <laughs> like, I don't give a, a fuck. This movie is fucking weird. It won because it was weird, and they were people are like, oh my god, it's weird. So it must be good. <laughs> But anywho, that's what I have to say about that movie. All right. Um, I'm I'm really disappointed, since you went with this theme, that one of these is not, that it's not a long way to the top if you want to rock and roll. I'm, I'm kind of disappointed in you for that. But uh, uh, I guess... Well, I couldn't. I mean, keep... Scott Pilgrim's the only thing that I would have that I would apply to that. <laughs> um... I guess let's go to Long But Great. Okay, so I finally saw uh, Scorsese's latest that, um, as this mosquito attacks my computer, um, what's it called? It's called, uh, Killers of Flower Moon. That's it. Yeah. For the three and a half hour, um, Scorsese basically, it's like gangsters, but like in like the late Western period. And so, like, this uh, Native American tribe, they end up on this reservation, and they basically struck oil, strike oil. And it's all about, like, the internal effort to kind of, like, befriend these this tribe and, like, you know, mix mix with them, um, you know, like, marry, marry them off so they can get part of their wills and get at this money, and they're really trying to screw them over royally. Um, Leo, with his constant frown in this movie... Does a great job. The the lady who plays the um, his wife, uh, the Native American, great stuff too. Uh, probably also another one of the best performances I've seen from De Niro in quite a while. Um, a lot of good like Native American lore in there. Um, themes of like you know, basically your 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 people being like fading fading away from the earth because you know you're letting it happen that kind of deal. And then um, basically modern society like you know, killing off these traditions. So, um, really long movie, but, uh, I liked it a lot better than Irishman. Irishman, I thought dragged quite a bit, but this had me pretty, pretty well engaged throughout the whole thing. And Brendan Fraser shows up in the last act to be a a lawyer. So now, you know, I was about to ask you if it was better than old fellas, but you answered that for me. So, no, uh, Goodfellas is still probably my favorite. Um, slash, no, no not Goodfellas, old fellas. Oh, Irishman, old fellas. Oh, the Irishman. Oh, okay. Ah, uh-huh. yeah. Because that movie was way, like you said, it dragged. It dragged so much. The whole thing dragged. But anywho, <laughs> we didn't, we're not here to is... talk about the Irishman. All right, Mid Monsters. No, we're here to talk about the Mid Monsters. Mm-hmm. Which is uh, our boy Al Pacino and our personal friend Jonathan. Oh, yeah. Mr. Uh, John, not Johnny Bravo, uh, Donnie Brasco. 
<laughs> yes, Donnie Brasco, that's the one. <laughs> I had never seen it before. I had picked it up randomly at like a thrift store or a pawn shop or something, you know, a dollar or whatever. Mm-hmm. And it had been sitting on my shelf. And uh, Carl and I decided we were going to redo our kind of like random movie thing. Um, and I put it in there and, you know, we happened to pawn it randomly. And the movie's not bad. It's just not great. It's, it's not memorable. It's just very mid. Like, like. Did you ever see Blow? Yeah, I guess it's weird. I, I, I ha- it's been a long time, but I loved Blow when I saw it previously. Okay. Like, I mean, it's probably been 10 plus years. So, but kind of yeah, a this similar is, um, vibe with, you know, Johnny Depp being, you know, this this particular kind of person. Or whatever, how it yeah, yeah, life. except for that was, that was more Colombian, and this is, this is like the mafia. Yeah. Like Gabagool, <laughs> like <laughs> the Italians, you know, this was in New York. Um, and like Michael Madsen's in it, Anne Hache is in it. It was like kind of strange seeing Anne Hache with like long hair and being uh, like playing a hetero. I mean, there's nothing wrong with it. I, I mean, like the actors were all fine. Like the actors all were good. They did their part well. But like, um, it was just, um, yeah, it was just mid. Like, like if you'd made this movie and didn't have great actors in it, it probably it would just it was already. A, unforgettable great actors in it it would have just been like terrible without them i mean if you want to watch a a 90s mob movie you know set in the 60s or 70s based on a real story um and the dude put like a hundred like tons and tons of gangsters away um and i guess this was you know uh, this was a few years after goodfellas a couple several years after goodfellas but i guess it was that hey this is a mob movie based off a real story we should make it kind of thing um but it it was definitely not near as good. Okay, okay. I remember enjoying it fairly well, but now that I think back about it, like nothing really stands out besides you know the typical uh, you know trying to get away with mob shit when you're uh, you're you got a wife and kids, right? Yeah, like um, I mean, spoiler alert: Johnny Depp is an undercover agent. Um, he is an FBI, FBI agent. He is, he is an FBI agent. Oh, uh, started a thing. Yes, um, we have. But yeah, it's a fun thing. <laughs> um. So anyway, I am intrigued to know what comic book movie you watched that was long before they hit their stride. Is it is it an is it an OG X Men? Is it Blade? Before that, before that, this was is it, it the Wayne's is bra- it the 80s Punisher? No, after that, this was a '90s movie. Uh, so '90s, Damon Wayans and um, Blank Man. What the fuck? Never <laughs> even heard of that. So this is like a kind of a satire on the old um, Batman show, and it's uh, Damon Wayans. He is playing pretty nerdy guy. Who uh, wants to become a superhero? His uh, grandmother is supporting a um, this guy trying to get elected for mayor. She gets killed off, and so they want to go and get back at the mobsters who took out their granny. And um, yeah, it's it's definitely aimed for an older audience, but all the really charming superhero elements uh, definitely tickled me as a kid. Um, <laughs> there's this crazy scene where they go and help this lady deliver a baby, and she. Uh, um, she like grabs. She goes to grab the one guy's hand, the brother's hand, and uh, actually grabs his dick. And it's like, oh, you got a real big finger. He's like, thank you. And you know, she delivers her baby. But um, some really good moments in this. It's it, it holds up pretty well, but nobody talks about it. Blank man, watched it over and over, and as a as a kid, long before Tobey Maguire was Spider Man. So Spider Man, Spider Man. He does whatever a spider can. <laughs> Feature movie one. So we got Scott Pilgrim vs. The World. This is a 2010 romantic action comedy film co-written and produced by and directed by Edgar Wright based on a graphic novel series. It stars an ensemble cast of Michael Sarah as Scott Pilgrim, a slacker musician who is trying to win a competition to get a record deal while also battling seven evil exes um, of his newest girl, girlfriend, Ramona Flowers, 
Is he really in a competition to rec get a record deal? Doesn't like just the the main evil X like try to give him one and like try to make his band like sell out? That doesn't seem right. You need to go on Wikipedia and fix this, Joey. Um, no, no, oh, no. Yeah. This is right. They oh, are yeah. in a battle of the bands, mm -hmm. trying to get a record deal from Gideon or from G-Man Graves, who turns out to be the Gideon that Ramon, Ramona talks about during the movie. Uh, you just don't know that until then. I see. Played by Mary yes. Elizabeth Wonstad. All right, fun facts. Um, hold on. So before before we do fun facts, I have a. Mm -hmm. After this watching, is mm -hmm. Mary Elizabeth Winstead still your favorite manic pixie dream girl? Yeah, I got it. Because that was it. in your previous review. Yep, I read that earlier today. Um, it, I would say that's still a fact. Yeah, big facts, big, big, big facts. Well, right. anywho. <laughs> big facts. <laughs> um, big facts. What's that chick from Thor and Two, two Broke Girls? Kat Dennings? Is she a manic pixie dream girl? I don't think so. Okay. She's just, I'm, I'm a fucking smoke show. Uh-huh. Smoke show. Smoke <laughs> I don't think show. I've heard that one. All right, so the four cast members that make up the band Sex bob -omb spend several weeks learning how to play guitar as a band, and Michael Sarah had to dumb down his bass playing, bass, his bass playing, his bass fishing, <laughs> his bass playing, in order to not outshine his bandmates. And your right obtained permission to use famous theme music from the Super Nintendo game, The Legend of Zelda, Link to the Past, by writing le a letter to Nintendo saying that it is considered to be the nursery rhyme of his generation. Is that I mean, right? He's not is... fucking wrong. I thought it was the I thought it was the Ocarina of Time music that was in this. Ocarina. Crazy? If it's SNES, it's a link to the past. Ocarina mm -hmm. is in sixty four, and this but... was definitely more on eight bit graphic kind of stuff. It's, it's if I am not mistaken, it is a link, link to well, the past, I... which well... is. The best Zelda game. Hard stop. Well, isn't the Super Nintendo system 32-bit? No. It is eight. not. It's 18? <laughs> it's not 8. Six. It's 16. Okay, well, that's more than 8. <laughs> yes, but you said 18, and I said no. Anywho. Oh. Anywho. Bit, bit anywho. bad. Edgar Wright? has stated yeah, that the movie stated. was done in the style of a musical. But instead of the characters breaking into the song, they broke into dance. Or, <laughs> they broke into fighting. <laughs> and in the 8-bit Universal logo at the beginning of the film was Edgar Wright's idea. It was then designed by his brother, Oscar Wright. Just 8-bits? Hmm? <laughs> yeah, eight bit. The universal, the logo at the beginning was eight bit. There was a lot of eight bit shit in this in this movie, my guy. But as any yes, if I'm not mistaken, and maybe I'm just being fucking forgetful at this hour of night in my advanced these, age. You used to sell this shit all the time, right? For a little while, yeah, I did. Mm. I did. I did for a little while sell sell this shit. Um, <sighs> but anyway. so I'm hitting um, miss with Edgar Wright. I think you are too. But uh, this is easily my fave. Um, he adapts this like a comic, not, uh, oh, I'm not familiar with the comic, but yeah, he adapts it beautifully like one with all this, uh, comedy, sassy characters, romance, bands, fighting and pop culture. Whew. Oh yeah. Yeah. So I think this is my favorite of his movies, but I don't know if it, it is better than last night in Soho. Um, but it's a completely it different is. style of movie, so... For sure. Yeah. I, didn't, I didn't realize you watched that one. Oh, yeah. No, I watched that. Hold on. Let's go into this. Let me see. I watched that... Uh, November 28th, 2021. And oh, gave it substantially more stars than you did. Didn't I... So... Didn't I just give it, like, four or four and a half? You three and, three and, a half. and a half. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. And I gave it the big five. The big one five. Yeah, because it hit you. I gave it 15 stars. Because it's on the nose. 
Um, definitely had. Would you consider yeah, no, this I, a, a punk a punk rock vibe? Oh yeah, there's definitely a lot of punk rock vibes going on in this. Or like, okay. maybe I wasn't sure if it was like alternative indie, or punk rock, but more or maybe like punk rock or definitely indie rock for sure. I mean, it's, it's, the whole movie is about indie bands, so yeah. I, I wouldn't say punk in the like the like the style. Like if you think of like like the Ramones kind of punk or something, but mm -hmm. um. But you know, definitely more tuned into the music scene than I, and in terms of different flavors of rock, there's so many now. It's so hard to keep up with. I love how like the sound effects like like come up kind of like in like puffs of smoke or just like kind of graphics and like even like the opening title scene like or text like is like kind of gyrating with the music or whatever. Mm -hmm. Good stuff. It Sarah's works. great as this uh, this self conscious character. I'm I'm curious to actually read some of like Scott Pilgrim, like see if he's more confident in the um in the comics or more of this like overthink kind of character. But it, it's it's just really it's fun to see him mixed into this um such a strange concept concept of falling in love with a girl, but then you know being thrust into the this uh, video game uh, style combat. Would you, would you fight several, seven evil exes for a girl you had just started dating? Um, you know, especially if you saw her in a dream and then at a party and then she skate, she roller skated through the, the desert inner brain, inner brain <laughs> highway in your brain to deliver you a package. And then I was like, do rollerblades even appear anywhere else in this movie? And she does like, she's on rollerblades to deliver that package, but like, it's like s snowy everywhere. So. Not sure how that was working in terms of um, well, when she when she rollerblades back to give him his num like her number, like you see it like kind of fucking like fly all out of the way and shit. So mm. she's you know power skating. She's yeah. Ooh, drinking the Mike's hard tonight. Half tea, half lemonade. I've been drinking oh, a lot. Aren't I you? Had one of these in a while. What? Is is that is that a forty? No, it's just a like a twenty four or something, isn't it? It's a tall it? boy. Go with that terminology. I well I had a Yuhu that is already gone and now I have Hawaiian punch flavored water. Hell yeah, let's fucking go. I'll just break out the crystal while we're at it. Bruh. Man, if you can afford Crystal, I want to know why the fuck you've been holding out on me all these years. <laughs> Kieran Culkin's in this as the gay snarky roommate that loves to give him shit, even in his sleep. He can sleep text shit. Uh, yeah, he Anna does Kendrick sleep text at... Anna Kendrick in this movie. Go ahead. I say he does sleep text Anna Kendrick, and then as you put here, Anna Kendrick in her primo bitch form. Look, she's just being... The head pitch, okay? She's just, did, I, she's just... did you rewrite that or did I write that? No, you wrote that. Oh, because there's a typo. Of course I wrote that. <laughs> <laughs> primo. Look, you said it. I'm not used to writing not... Primo. I like Primo. She's a Primo bitch. I believe. I don't think this is still going to make it correct, but I believe that is, uh, that's, that's what you're looking for. You are yeah, just but, one vowel off. But there's an E2 <laughs> in her prime. That's bitch prime. Form. Not we are primo, editing a fucking. We are, we are auditing. We are. What the hell? We are Look editing a editing. Google Doc on a podcast. <laughs> <laughs> and it's riveting. Should I should I actually edit this into the stream? Uh, no, it. I'm not. I'm not recording the the, the 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 screen, so there's no way to see the the magic of the the words changing. All right. So knives uh, does not seem to like much at first. Knives does not seem. To oh, she doesn't, doesn't seem, seem like, like she's not like. Earth. Right. Right. Uh, but she is such a sweet character and is fun to watch date Scott. I love the um, the Dance Dance Revolution kind of game that they're playing, which I guess plays in a lot with the combat style later. It does, and they actually use a lot of that D&D &D stuff. D&D, &D, wow. 
DDR. We are a not mess DM, tonight. DDR. We're getting sloppy. I'm all over the place. We're breaking the waves. Oh God. Well, look, I'm just gonna go to sleep when you go to talk about that. That's all you. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Um, but as far as um, Scott Pilgrim is dating a high school. Like obviously, this movie's not getting made now, and obviously, we don't want 22 year olds dating typically high schoolers. They do say she's 17. She has a birthday where she's 18. So like, it's not I mean, great. But also, they don't like, see it. I mean, he he's not being predatory. In the sense of, like, he's trying... He's dating her just to fuck her. Like, he's actively... Like, they're just playing fucking video games and, like, going shopping and, and, and talking. And he even says that it's simple. Like, is it still unfair and not right? Yes. But, like, it's also not predatory in the way that most people think of when they're thinking of a 22-year-old dating a 17-year-old. Do we, do we get into this about licorice pizza? probably but also wasn't home home girl was uh like well more than 22 like she was like almost she was like 27 28 or something right yeah that's a bigger example and that's one that's more people talk about more i don't know it's just whenever we go on whenever you go into a movie and like you have this relationship going on and like if the two people seem natural together like i mean they do point out specifically here the age difference but like yeah, I was just curious if it if you rubbed the wrong rubbed you the wrong way. It doesn't to me. That and everybody else also ridicules him for it. Mm-hmm. It's almost so instead it's of being like, like an icky thing about them, it's more of like just like fuel fuel for everyone to talk shit about him. Mm. Yeah. Oh, my son Nolan passed by during uh, Aubrey Plaza. Like I think she's working at a Starbucks and cussing at a uh, Scott nonstop, and it's like bleeping her out editing to keep and i think in the fun facts it said that that helped us uh, stay under uh, our rating we had a good laugh at that um if it You're, does you didn't put it in the fun facts i know that's okay. what i'm saying but yeah like um, but yeah, I, I assume that is why it was done. One, it was funny, but two, it, it, it kept it from being an R-rated movie for sure. <laughs> so, so, yeah, so you're not into, the... uh, was I say, so yeah. you're not into, to, to Anna, but you're, or Aubrey, but we're into Mary Elizabeth. I don't know, but in, in particular, I'm sure... At some point on the cast, we were probably talking about some real slender blonde or something, and I was just saying that they weren't my weren't my cup of tea. But yeah, uh, Weinstead. I mean, she's not like you know um, exactly my type. She's a you know. Um, I'm curious how old she is. Hold up, hold up. I want to I want to circle back to something real quick. Okay. You said that uh, skinny blondes aren't your type. Well. It depends. I was about She's to say, 39. Um, I, I mean, I yeah, I kind of married think, a skinny blonde, but I mean, not exactly, but okay. I mean, or was it, was it more her demeanor? We, this is a whole nother conversation that, that we don't need to <laughs> go into. I, okay, I fell I'm in love with my spouse of, 16 okay. come on 16 years Oof, uh. fair enough fair enough <laughs> okay I was there, like, wait a okay second. now i'm gonna have to go back and look at what girls i've had to def- okay so i'm uh, it might it might have come up in all that jazz i i mean i didn't think that i think one of the girlfriends in that was like all that great but i mean i mean they're all pretty obviously but there's just i mean she's not like the, the curviest girl but like there's just something about like her look and like the, the, that dyed hair or whatever and like her whole like emo vibe that just works oh so. you no know, i'm bro i am 100 percent with you she you know she's she's a badass she fucking skates around she's got cool hair i mean she's freaking hot like yeah no i will i will take ramona flowers mary elizabeth winstead over cheerleader who gets left at the redneck while the stunt girls go drive the car Mary Elizabeth Winstead any day of the week 
So in addition to all the fun style, we also get um, this desperate romance from uh, Scott. Uh, Ram Ramona's not like, not like dismissing him, but not really disinterested, but just like seems like she needs to be impressed. So he like keeps trying, keeps trying, keeps trying. It's cool how like they, they bring all that style in. I think it was like split screens and stuff at that one party where they meet. And then he checks in with the girl, like the guy who's just like, oh yeah, Ramona Flowers. Blah, blah, blah. So there's all this like conversation about her as he's getting to know her. Yeah, because he, he, he had editing. seen her like the, like the library or whatever and um, while he was out with knives. Well, he's helping knives study. And then um, he goes to the party and he draws this bad picture and, he, and she's like, oh yeah, the dude's like, that's Ramona Flowers. And then Aubrey Plaza's like, don't you fucking, don't you dare fucking date Ramona Flowers or whatever. She's the coolest person I know. And then he meets her and he says like, this thing that he had said denies about Pac-Man, but it didn't hit the same with her. Oh, yeah. And then it's, <laughs> it was a whole thing. Yeah. Haku Paku. Yeah. Uh, isn't it weird how this whole like dating slash like Battle of the Bands thing is like in snowy Canada? I mean, it doesn't seem like it's definitely like toasty inside compared to what's going on, on the outside. But I mean, it makes for some fun moments. Like um, I think I mentioned later on that that like virgin snow over this um, swing set. Or vice versa. Um, great scene there. Kind of reminded me of Kill, of Kill Bill in a couple ways. Oh, with all the snow, like at the end, at the House of House of Blue Leaves at the end? That part, um, I saw in the fun facts that Quentin Tarantino, he made some recommendation about this movie, so... Um, that I didn't know. That's interesting. Let me look that up while you... Uh, so, what, what are, what's some... Do you have a history with this movie at all? I mean, no, I just I just watched it, and it, it, I mean, it's fucking dope. I mean, I love video games. I think we've been over that before, and, you know, like, obviously, most people like music. Um, and I, I do, I mean, like, what other movie is like this? Like, there's all this musical element, and then there's all this crazy video game fighting and, like, you know, 8-bit stuff and just, like... The, the Spider-Verse style kind of matches it a little bit, but then this, like, this takes from so much other stuff. Compared to, you know, strictly comics with Spider-Man. Yeah. Oh, and the fucking... We, we talked about the cast. It was like you've got four four different people that played... At least four different people who played superheroes in this movie. Mm -hmm. Three of them playing decent roles. One of them played a very small role. But, um, yeah, like it's, it's kind of absurd. It's just an absurd movie that I just absolutely love. <laughs> Allison Pill is so really cute, fine. but they um, they really downplay her hotness in this. Who's that? That's the drummer. Okay. Well, it was a 50, 50 shot that it was her or the, the blonde chick that um, where Mary Elizabeth, where Ramona breaks out the big hammer. Oh, okay. Yeah. So... Did we, did we find out what, what you're still Keep stretching? stretching. <laughs> Stretch for time. Keep stretching. Um, okay. Originally, the film only had a title card at the beginning. It was Quentin Tarantino who suggested to Edgar Wright, late in the stage of post-production, that there should be a pre-title credit sequence. Otherwise, the remaining ensemble of characters yet to be introduced would not be introduced in much more rapid succession. The audience might be overwhelmed with the introduction of the character and plot. In the pre-title sequence, the audience is given a chance to relax and have a firmer grasp of the beginning of the film. Wright considered this and agreed. Like the idea, the first scene would now be a prologue. So, now we know. Nice. All right. Not well, just that another thing enough. that UT has his fingers in. That has his fingers in randomly. <laughs> his his feet all over. <laughs> no, he doesn't want his feet all over. He uh, wants other people's feet on him. Shouldn't should there have been a moment where Scott actually learns to fight since it's like just this natural reaction that happens? No, nah, it's better this way. It's just that Okay. Just because. I mean, that, that's how old school video games were. There weren't like tutorials and shit. You just were like, hey, we're going. Let's let's go. Why was E.T. gray? 
Why not? Was it? What was that? The line? It's from Rubber, right? Why is he? T- oh God, I don't. What, what's remember the response? What's movie? the response there? Gosh, no, gosh, from me looking up this, all these other movies. You, you, you pull in a quote or, from a movie that I saw one time. That <laughs> maybe it doesn't. I think it. I think it doesn't matter. Is the, the thing is like, why is E.T. gray? It doesn't matter. <laughs> That sounds probably potentially could be right. I don't. I don't know. But speaking of rubber, I did. I did do that in my spinoff <laughs> podcast of uh, um, <laughs> Schlock you Talk. Needed, uh, you needed I, a rubber. <laughs> well, I mean, you're sleeping around with uh, people, you know, new partners and stuff. You probably should use one of those. Roger that. Yeah. 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 Just just an FYI, so you don't get STIs <laughs> and or children that you may or may not want. Oh, my God. So what did you think about the high score coin explosions of the guys getting defeated? They're cool. It's dope. Makes sense. I enjoy it. I thought it was a, thought because... it was a, a fun little touch. Uh, gotta feel bad for knives and how Scott looks like a cartoon as he avoids her. Um, yeah, that was my biggest laugh last night as I watched this. It was like knives shows up at the door and Scott like comically throws his bag and um, himself out the window in very Bugs Bunny like fashion. So um, yes, I got a hearty laugh out of that one. Yeah, that's that's good shit. That's oh, that's good shit. Ramona, this is a really lame made-up song. He's just like, and then she's, I can't wait to hear. Great. I can't wait till it's finished. And it's like yeah. he's like so like hurt. <laughs> uh, lots of dating scenes. Um, then the battles. Captain America as a uh, stunt. Um, no, no, he's like an action star, he's, and he has he, a bunch of stunt doubles. He's the action star. Yeah, 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 yeah. And he has a and bunch they kick of stunt his ass. doubles. And then, uh, but they challenge him. He challenges them to a a legendary grind that is just too intense for him. He's like, you can't goad me into that. And he's like, there's girls watching. He's like, give me my fucking board. (laughs) And Culkin has it right there. He's like, big fan. (laughs) It's like, that was like a plan. Originally. Yeah, it's, it's fun how like, all of a sudden, we find out that each of these uh, characters has secret uh, weaknesses, especially the um, the chick with the the eye black. Uh, uh, yeah, the back of the knee. <laughs> I totally forgotten Brie Larson was in this uh, on my second watch. Ah, uh, yes, Envy and, um, slash Natalie. Scott's yeah, got to notice big, who that was. Uh, since I was more aware, much more aware from, a, from uh, Captain Marvel. So. Yeah. Yes. Well, I mean. Yeah, her her boyfriend. So that's Captain Marvel, and we've said Captain America. Her her boyfriend, who's Ramona's ex, number he's number three is Todd. He's Brandon mm-hmm. Routh. He's Superman. Oh and yeah. He plays that counts. And it, essentially, he, barely he plays Vegeta, basically oh. or not Vegeta. He basically plays Goku. He's a fucking soup, a vegan Super Saiyan. But uh, he gets he gets tricked. He gets a little overzealous with all of his vegan powers, and uh, he gets tricked into drinking uh, milk. And the vegan police show up, and one of the vegan police is Thomas Jane, the Punisher. Right, right. Oh, <laughs> and yeah, yeah. <laughs> like I said, fucking Marvel and DC up in this bitch. And then they take his, they take him to vegan jail, uh, and that was great. They're like. They're like, you had gelato. And he's like, that's that's not vegan. They're like, milk and eggs, bitch. And he's like, <laughs> and then you had a chicken farm. And he's like, wait, chicken's not vegan? Yeah. <laughs> and it oh, just, yeah. it reminded me there's this real flirting around. Or if, you know, if you're, if you're, a, if you're a Z or on, on the, the TikTok um, where this kid is pouring strawberry milk into a glass. And he's like, ah, oh, it's strawberry milk. Uh, I, I like strawberry milk because it's vegan. Because it comes from a strawberry and not a cow. <laughs> I'm not, I was not aware of that one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I've only seen people like reacting to it. I haven't seen the actual video, so I don't know if there's something else after that. But it's so fucking hilarious. So, good moment where uh, Scott is very slow to get that uh, Roman Roma, uh, Ramona Ramona 
yeah, that's the word. Um, had a had a girl phase, a girl and girl phase. So you mean a sexy phase? By curious, I'm by furious. Yep, that was pretty funny. I only um, remember that because where... I just happened to have subtitles on and I paused it and I was like, oh, that's a funny line. <laughs> And this is where Ramona, we see Ramona is a badass too. She pulls out his big ass hammer out her purse and mm-hmm. is fighting the, the sword whip. And we, um, we have the uh, sex bomb taking on the uh, one of the exes, which is like this twins like techno group. And they have like mm-hmm. a. They're uh, five and six. They're having a music battle and their music summons kaiju. And Sex Bobomb has the Killer Gorilla. And I think the other thing has like double dragons. So it's Yes, they have they have double Oriental dragons, yes. Pretty wicked. Yeah, that was pretty good. Connections. Yeah, it was it was a pretty good it was a pretty Oh, uh, is that like King Kong versus Double Dragon? Is that what it's doing there? I believe so, yeah. Or Donkey Kong? Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I love how Jason uh, Schwartzman is is very Wes Anderson in this very uh, buttoned up villain role. As an, uh, yeah, he's such like a like a slimy like. Yeah, I don't know. He's so good in this movie. <laughs> in a little, he has a mind control movie. chip in the back of her head and wild. Oh yeah, we skipped over. Um, she changed. Ramona changes her hair. From like the 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 purple or the red pink whatever at the beginning to blue and Scott kind of freaks mm-hmm. out and then Knives sees it and is like over that. he only and like Knives keeps calling her a fat ass and, uh, and then puts like a blue streak in her hair and then um when she goes when they're backstage with um with Envy and her the the clash of Demon Head um Brandon Routh punches her and punches the blue out of her hair. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, the movie's absolutely, literally fucking absurd. It's it's great. It's, um, as I put in my review, it's 100% uh, based in realism. It's just completely founded in realism and nothing over the top. <laughs> yeah, I love it when they're both looking in the mirror, um, Knives and Ramona with the blue hair. And I think Ramona's just like, what is that? <laughs> it's like, you know, mimicking her. Uh, um... Fun double climax video game, sword fighting, um, with the final uh, X there. Ah, uh, yes. Or, you know, they have the, he has the good There's fight. An extra I, I really life, like, you know, after. Ready Player One style. Yeah, after he loses and he uses the extra life and they kind of speed run back up to the big fight, but then he, I want to fight you for you and he learns the power of self and. Yay. And they have this, you know. Then he yeah, takes on a fight, bonus then, boss. With yeah, he takes on mm. Mega Scott, but that's pretty easy because Mega Scott's also uh, played by Michael Sarah, so they can just shoot the shit and be all like bros. He enjoys that. Yeah, they're gonna go. They're gonna go have brunch. I and had then... what's the, uh, the? I think I had a Mandela effect because I, I I could have sworn like I I even wrote about it the last time I watched this how I swore Scott's ended up with knives, but. Nope, he gives uh, Roma, Ramona gives him another shot. Yes, well, Knives, she's going to leave to let him and Knives be together, and then Knives is like, "No, go be with her. This is what you were doing all of this for." And so he goes, he goes with her, and he goes with Ramona. Dream doorway. So this mm, mo- yes. definitely the most visually uh, stimulating action rom coms ever. Pure fun, character nostalgia, and heart. And it's a hell of a lot of fun to watch. Five stars. Yeah, five stars easily. The movie is literally absurd. It's so much fun. Like this is, like you said, just to sit down and eat popcorn. And it has everything. It has action. It has music. It has romance. Like it, it literally has everything. Um, so and, and it has like quippy and witty dialogue. Like it, it yeah, it's. It's fucking great. And you if you haven't seen it, you should watch it. <laughs> All right. Featured movie two. Breaking the Waves, a 1996 psychological romantic melodrama film directed and co-written by Lars von Schreer. And starring Emily Watson in her feature film, uh, acting debut, 
uh, with Stellan Skarsgård, a frequent collaborator with Von Trier. The story takes place in the Scottish Highlands in the early 1970s. It's about an unusual young woman and the love she has with her husband. The film is divided into seven chapters and epilogue separated by audiovisual art by Perk Kirkaby and accompanied by music. Uh, this is the first film in Lars von Trier's Golden Heart Trilogy, which includes The Idiots, one of my most hated films ever, um, Dancer in the Dark, one of my, whew, it's a hard one, a good one. One of, the, one of my most hated movies ever. Yeah, and the former made in compliance with the Dogma 95 Manifesto. We might touch on that. Um, so I, I pulled this out. Um, so the Golden Heart Trilogy is all the movies feature uh, heroines who remain, remain naive despite their actions. Not a trait you're a fan of. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, all right. So first thing uh, I would like to say, you mentioned Dancer in the Dark. Go back to the season two, episode one premiere, where we did talk about Dancer in the Dark. Um, that was our musical episode, um, where we paired that with Umbrellas and Sherboard. Um, Clear the contrast. Very, well. very, yeah, very ridiculous contrast in movies. Um, I think that was the last time we did an LVT movie. We did at least one in season, we did Dogville in season one, that one in season two. We didn't do any in seasons three and four, and now we're just, they're not seasons, they're episodes, whatever. But, um, yeah, so you'll notice a trend if you go back and listen to Dogville, which was like, what, episode three or four? It was very early. Mm -hmm. And then that one, which would have been like episode 11, and now we're into like episode 70, 71, something like that. Yeah. And that was a very um, I don't know if rattling uh, review you had wrote. You just said like, Barf emojis all down the thing. Oh, yeah. And so I, I was I, like, I ooh, real. was not I expecting that. Doing, I did think about doing that again since this one was broken to chapters, but um, I I decided to hit you with that. I don't know if you clicked on the link that I left for you in that review. Yeah, it was um, a Booker T thing. Yeah, yeah. Did you? Well, because it said I'm coming for you, and that's the end of that line. It's the like one of the most infamous... Um, one of the most infamous, uh, like backstage segments, promos, whatever you want to call it in like wrestling history, because he drops the N word. Uh, uh, okay. Yeah. All but right. Anywho, um, I have I, 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 a psychological romantic melodrama. Okay. I have fir first, 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 first. What? in the fuck in this movie is romantic. Like, I get that she falls in love, they fall in love and they get married, but like, this, this, this movie, there's nothing, nothing romantic in this movie, in my opinion. Okay, continue. <laughs> All right, so fun facts about Breaking the Waves. Uh, Helena Barna Carter was originally cast in the role of Bess. One of the reasons she turned it down was because she was not comfortable with the sexual content. Um, it was determined to write a story that... W okay, so this is a quote about Lars von Trier, which plays a lot into, uh, I think, what Carl said in the movie. Um, I was determined to write a story that was so far-fetched, so full of cliches that no one would take it seriously. But of course, the audience liked it. All you have to do is come up with something really stupid, and it makes it becomes a great success. You like you like being talked down to and called an idiot by someone who thinks they're smarter than everybody else, because that's what that is. And you love this movie, so yeah. How does it feel to be called an idiot by the director of this movie? That's what I just had. If it, it takes a prick like that to make something this obscure. So, I mean, it's obscure. Anyway, continue along. <laughs> All right. So Martin Scorsese and um, Roger Ebert uh, really enjoyed this. One of their top films of the 1990s. Uh, Stellan Skarsgård has appeared in uh, seven Lars von Trier movies. 
uh, co-writer, director, Laws von Trier, spent five years writing the script and gathering the financing to get the film made, by which time he says he lost enthusiasm for it. <laughs> yeah, that seems spot on. That seems spot on. It's so weird to like, maybe if he had you know, maybe, I, I was noting it. all these before I like dove back into my feelings on the movie and to hear him say like, yeah, I, I made it really stupid, but it worked. And um, I, I stopped caring about making it. Um, the film was adapted into a stage play and an opera. Now you know. All right, um. so... Maybe if he hadn't lost enthusiasm for it, he would have found a better goddamn camera. And we'll get into that shortly. Well, you know, that's what he does. Um, okay, this is my third time watching Breaking the Waves. Um, I recall being highly intrigued to see this because somebody had commented on one of these, like, movie um, criterion uh, Facebook pages that this was like, this would change the life of any married man that checked it out. And so it's like, oh, that's interesting. My question, my, my, my question here is, so, okay, that's a reasonable be like, hey, someone says this about this movie. That's a reasonable reason to want to check it out. But having watched this movie, did you go back and like respond to this person and be like, yo, what the fuck? Or di did it, did it change your life as a married man? As, and I'm not married, haven't been married have been in, you know, serious relationships and, and live with some of my partners and such. Um, but I, I don't see how this would change your life with whoever you're living with. Like it's, it's supposed to change your life. Like, I, I don't, I don't know. Like that. I that agree. Has me... There's faults in this story, but the movie also plays with a lot of big ideas from a kind of perverted perspective. And Mia and my existentialism, I like to get into, find it very intriguing. So. Okay. And I break it all down. So that's not an ambiguous little, uh, you know, nothing line. Um, I remember being taken by it both times and I typed, um, this time I keyed more into the religious um, perspective of this because I think... Both times before, I always got really in tune with um, Bess and like this split this, this split personality disorder she seems to have in terms of being so devout that she feels like God's speaking directly to her. And so she makes this scrumbly noise like as if there's like a, you know, a, a good angel on one shoulder and a, um, you know, a devil on the other shoulder, like between her I mean, human desires and like a divine voice. Go ahead. Yeah, I, t I, I took that more as like literally her and, you know, at God, not necessarily the, the, the angel and the devil. But I guess, I mean, that could be portrayed that way. But to me, that definitely came as, as she she was playing kind of the role of God in whatever way that it, it came out in her head um, mm -hmm. to either to, to whichever way to steer her for whatever thing she was trying to do kind of thing. And I really keyed in this time how the movie kind of fucks with you with how it really makes this convincing for her. And it also lightly makes it convincing that everybody knows that she's crazy. And then it's also selling the fact that something is to this. There's some magic involved, so, so to say, uh, magical realism, so, so to speak. So, um, so each one of those taking each other seriously makes quite the, I guess, what would be the word? Um, paradox? Yeah, if you have like, yeah, I guess that would be, what, what, that would be a paradoxical theme. Because, so just... I mean, I understand like the beef with like her going all the way with her martyrdom and in, ending up dying. But like, the only way she could be like 100% convincing with what she believed the whole time is if that's how it turned out. Yeah, so... Um, Which we're, jump, we're jumping around a little bit. I guess let's... Maybe yeah, we'll pump the brakes on that well, one. But, but to, to, to that point, since... Um, about her martyrdom and being that hard in her beliefs, like... <clears throat> 
Okay. I'm going to preface this by saying that I don't, I don't hate that people are religious. If you want to be religious, be religious. Worship who you want to worship. No, I, I'm, I'm finding this perspective fascinating because I think there's two, two different ways you can watch this movie and it, and it might affect you differently. Um, you know, as long as you're not hurting other people or anything, or, you know, that kind of stuff, you do you, do you boo-boo. But, like, in this movie, you're talking about where she took this so far to her to her martyrdom, to her death. Um, so, obviously, part of it is that mental illness that they show you throughout the movie. It's obviously never stated, other than I think they mentioned that she had been uh, committed once before, and then they try to commit her again. But And then her this... doctor in the... The doctor, wherever, like, in the remote place she was living... Was able to, was enabling her with pills. Doesn't really say what that was, but then the new doctor in town, you know, shuts that down on her. So she's there's yeah. there's that too. So I don't know. Maybe it's lithium or something like that that would, Perhaps. especially this is to said in the seventies. Yeah, to keep her to keep her a little more level. Who who knows? But um, like to me, this 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 feeds off of this this small ass town that she lived in that is just essentially a religious commune that is just it's just beat into her head it's, it's all that she knows is this religion mm -hmm. and doing all of this for god so like every decision she makes like none of them are her decisions they are all based on everything that is around her and then like force fed to her in like essentially like a cult um and i know that that's gonna probably rub some people the wrong way and i'm sorry but when you're in th that, because I mean, it's about especially that tight of a religious community, yeah, you're definitely have some valid points there. Yeah, I mean, when when you're talking to the point of like this person is an outsider, and we don't like, you know, you had to get permission to have outsiders, and you couldn't like women can't talk in the church, and it's all run by these elders, which are all mm -hmm. of course old white guys, like bro, long beards. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so. <sighs> This was actually the first time I think I caught the bell foreshadowing because uh, they get married, but then they're like, oh, where's the wedding bells? And I'm like, we have no bells. So. Which, like, you know, most, most churches have bells. And then I guess, you know, they're a small town. Like, they don't have bells. You could, I could you know, st genuinely believe that, a, like, a town that small wouldn't have bells. Yeah. But it's such sense. a, like, it's like a, such a, such a, like, a common thing for churches to have bells that it is kind of odd that they don't have one, at least one. Mm hmm. Well, and, and, and even I think in this particular town, I mean, it doesn't seem like being married is a very, um, um, overly joyous occasion for everyone. Maybe it's, slightly underplayed in that aspect because i mean there seems to be this tradition of like the men going off and working and the women biding their time at home or whatever so that seems to be the, the tradition here um, yeah it does seem to be like i guess that I, I don't know if all of them go to that oil rig but i i assume that's kind of the main mm -hmm. the main job is the oil rig and some it or other nautical based professions fishing or something of that nature Probably so. And then the bell pays off later. We'll get to it. Um, all right. So with you as an atheist, did you ever think God as being real in this film? Well, I far less... Okay. So while I'm far less invested in my faith now, I feel that my viewpoint clings to what the character sees and is interacting with. So for... The majority of the film, I would say I was watching this and I believed what best believed. And but I can see somebody coming in, not believing at all, seeing, you know, seeing through that facade and in, right into like her um, mental illness. So just kind of wanting to get your take on what it what it what it's like to, you know, probably definitely watch it from that one viewpoint, but then also considering that um you know there's the other so like obviously as an atheist i'm not going to think of god being real like even like unless there is a movie where there is literally a god character like obviously there is not a god character in this movie but um having experienced people in my past that have 
some sort of split personality disorder or some sort of mental disorder and being highly religious and the kind of a toll and effect that it can take where you have the person who is religious but also sane and then the person that is religious and is not sane and they kind of like Jekyll and Hyde back and forth it does some wild shit um some wild wild shit um and like like I guess not com- you know coming in you know not having that that faith aspect or faith view or whatever you want to say know, yeah. like yeah this this whole like the whole movie like especially Bess is like I get from a mental standpoint why, why she's having these but you know to think that you know like hey by me going out and fucking some other dude is gonna help my husband get better and help him walk again like that's that's just so it's absurd it's absurd yeah and then or like the initial thing where you know some like some dude came home with a broken hand and he came home for like three days and then you know she prays for Jan to come home and she has this whole conversation with God like during the prayer and you know she can't like the fact she can't even like wait 10 days it's not even like he's going to be gone for a month or a year and I guess at this point we don't know exactly how long he's been gone but you know it, it we're at we're at 10 days so if he had been gone for a year let's just say it was a year like what is 10 more days at this point like mm-hmm. for for her to pray for that like pr- pray for him to come home and i think she actually just wanted him to come home like just mm-hmm. hey hey come home early and then you know he gets hurt and she's like oh my god i did this like it's it's up there <laughs> um you know it's like oh well if i don't wear my special this very specific jersey and you know scratch my leg the right way during a football game my football team loses like it, it's up there in that kind of level of absurdity you know like mm-hmm. and g- granted usually um you know your football or your sports superstitions are more in jest or in fun but mm-hmm. still so some of the points we'll probably get I'll, I'll probably brush over a little bit later but just to uh, kind of pick up on some of the uh, character motivations um, so there is a, like a high concern that like once Jan leaves, like she's becoming highly, highly obsessive to the point where, you know, like, you know, she's counting the days, which doesn't seem all that obsessive to me, but apparently the sister thought that was nuts and, and tore all that up. So that was, that's, that's a hit. It's also the fact that, so she's been brought up in this religious community and once she gets married, she finally just dis- discovers, you know, sex and i mean she turns into this whole like giddy schoolgirl ab- thing about it and becomes obsessed with it and so you know i don't want to leave behind that you know that urge being so new to her having a huge impact on her psychology so i mean yes there's there's definitely you know they 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 show him right after the wedding and you know i guess like during his like their like honeymoon or his still his his leave for the wedding, you know, where they're, they're, you know, kind of just acting like kids and kind of just screwing wherever mm-hmm. they find, find, find time for. And, you know, well, like, this... like, like you said, I don't, I, I don't think counting down, like counting down the days is this, is this crazy thing. But in that community, that was, it's just what like, mm-hmm. the women, the men were Good away point. and the women were alone and you just dealt with it. But yeah, like to, like, so to them, that was obsessive, even though to like us, that seems pretty normal. And like, obviously like she had never had sex. She starts getting sex, you know, for a week or whatever amount of time that it is. And then, you know, yawns away. Like, it's like she, you know, she, uh, you know, got a little addicted or what have you. And, mm-hmm. um, I'm, and I'm sure that also definitely played into the psychology, but like that goes back to being, I mean, um, this little... brief marriage point. I mean, she's used to hang out with these, you know, really shrewd people all the time. And now she's with this, happy-go-lucky carefree guy and like just having the time of her life with him and then all of a sudden he she's got he's gone and she's back with the shrewd folks and she just can't she can't put pam dorrit's back in the box yeah because you you know yeah she went from living in that like probably very strict traditional-ish style household um you know traditional for that town um to living with you know being around yorn and like you said he's carefree because he is an outsider and you know all of this and yeah it's you know you move out of your parents house and you move you have to move back in because you're on hard times and then they still you know you know you're 20 30 years old and they're like hey you have to be home by 11 you can't have friends over da 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 and it's like bro what um 
So I think, you know, in that sense, like there's a, you, you know, a lot of people can relate to that at least. Good time to bring up this whole, um, okay. So the first time I ever watched this, I have a friend named Johnny and he lent me a few copies of this and I put, I started watching one. I was like, Oh, this looks terrible. I started watching another other one. Oh, this looks terrible. I finally went to the Criterion version on, um, you know, Criterion channel. And then sure enough, it looks like this. <laughs> so, um, yeah, so this is that Dogma 95 style where they do it with these really um, low grade uh, digital cameras. And it's a lot of like close ups and weaving back and forth. Very, it's very uptight in your face and visceral and looks kind of cruddy. And I think uh, Joey has thoughts. Um, yeah, the movie does really look that shitty. Um, I, I also, I was lent a Blu-ray copy by, by our, our boy Johnny. And, um, I was amazed at like how bad it looked. And, you know, Carl's like, well, you know, it was shot on like a handheld camera in like 1996. And it's like, bro, like it looks like fucking garbage. Like, and normally I'm not a big person who's like, oh, you know, it matters this or it matters that, you know, I have, I know a bunch of people who are like, I won't watch a movie on a 1080i TV or I need my, my sports needs to be, you know, 8 million Hertz. I need an 8 million Hertz second TV for football or whatever. And I'm just like, bro, like it's not, you know, it's not that big a deal. Like I'll, I, I don't prefer a DVD, but I will watch a DVD if it's, you know, all the fuck I got kind of thing. But, um, mm -hmm. no, this movie will like fucking trash, like hot trash. And we're not even going to talk about well, one scene with CGI. We'll talk about that later. It also looked like, Mm. Um, so, you know, like to me, the poor looking and graining close ups with washed out color, it did not create a oh, visceral yeah. feeling for the story. It just, it just looked like shit. It just looked like shit, in my opinion. And like that's I said, fair. normally that's not a thing that bothers me. Like, obviously, like I like a lot of like shitty 70s movies that are very grainy and, you know, even like upscaled, you know, um, don't look great, but. Yeah, this 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 was a movie made in the '90s that was set in the '70s that looked like it was filmed in like the '70s or the '60s or something. I I don't know. It did, that aesthetic may work for some people. It did not work for me. I'd be curious to hear what you think of uh, Celebration. It's another. Um, so Ventaberg is like the uh, brother off um, director to um, Lars von Schreer. And he made this movie kind of in the same style with the washed out colors and so forth. He's not nearly as vindictive as Von Schreer. So, yeah, I'd be curious to see if that one hits you any differently. But maybe we'll get there. Who knows? Um, maybe so. So how do you feel about Bess as this repressed character? She's brought up in the strict religious community that does not even allow women to speak in the church. I think we covered that pretty well. Yeah, um like she is very repressed like everything about her is repressed and like you said you know the genie gets out of the bottle or you know and i guess in this case out of Jan's pants what have you um <laughs> and yeah she she's opened up this whole new world but she still has so much you know he leaves and then she's just stuck back in it and she has all of these i don't know 20 something years probably of or close to 20 years of all of this religious dogma that has just been um, basically force fed to her her entire life and then of course you said she has the mental illness that is not being treated or it is being mistreated and then you know then it's not being treated at all mm -hmm. and it's just she is she is very repressed and I feel like because she is a woman no one gives a flying fuck um, outside of Jan and even yeah but we have to both agree that Emily Watson's performance is freaking amazing not really you don't like her performance like even even stellan who's a great actor just was he was just kind of there like uh. yeah no when i when when i say it's like this, this did nothing for me i i did like it <laughs> like is a strong word but i did like it more than the other two LVT movies we mentioned earlier, um, both which have episodes, both Dogville and Dancer in the Dark. Um, I, do, I do like it more than those, but that is not saying much as I fucking absolutely abhorred those movies. So, um, yeah. So would you say her performance came off whiny? Her, 
her performance or like her you mean the actual character of Bess itself or of yeah. Beth, you know, of the yeah either way is fine I wouldn't say whiny like she missed her husband she wanted to be with her husband which this is her brand new husband um I don't think it's whiny. Like I'm sure that, you know, the way it was shown that the, the other people, like especially her mother in her town thought that she was whiny, but like, no, she just wanted to be with her husband. And again, back to mental illness and 20 years of all this religious dogma, like just fucking force fed. Like it, it makes for, as we see someone who's really got a lot of issues that they don't know how to deal with, and work through and has no support system to help her deal with them or work through them. I was thinking about the scene where, you know, he had, he's leaving on the plane because he has to go back to the oil rig and, um, you know, the chopper, she's like, but... yeah, that's right. Chopper. And, uh, yeah, she's screaming hysterically, you know, you know, yawn, yawn, please stay, stay, stay or whatever. And I had a very, very similar experience whenever I uh, left for several months from my significant other. So I think a lot of people could probably watch that and see that it's kind of over the top and melodramatic, but you know, to have actually kind of lived it in a way um, kind of made, gives me an interesting perspective. Yeah, I mean, no one, no one wants to be separated from their partner for a long period of time. Um, especially like, I don't like, especially when you're younger and it's not necessarily that they, that as they get older, they're like more okay with being away, but they're more, they're more easily able to handle their emotions because they know how to manage them better. You know, you know how to manage your better, your emotions better at 39 than at 19, just, you know, and there's way less hormones and shit raging. So, yeah. So what'd you think about the, um, the chapter cards with the uh, the nicer looking shot and the, the cool music. Okay, so I have two conflicting thoughts on this. So yes, they are the best looking part of the movie. I actually really liked them, and I liked that there was like music there, you know, like big named artists and such. However, <laughs> they just fucking lasted and lasted and lasted <laughs> and lasted. This is like a two and a half hour movie. We probably could have cut 10 to 15 minutes by shaving <laughs> most of those, those chapters. We didn't need that much chapter breakage, like at all. But that is a thing that he does. He gives us things in long periods where we don't need them, or he gives us extra shit after something happens in a movie that we don't need. And that's just a thing that he does, him being Lars von Trier. Compared to a lot of his other movies, this actually feels like a regular story. Just with really comparatively. In it. Yes. And in this movie, I will say he is very tame comparative to his other movies because he doesn't show a lot of the shit um comparatively. True. Um I will say, and I don't know if I mentioned this because goddess was years ago. And I, I feel like I probably did. I hate, I do hate that how badly I don't want to say hate, but it, it sucked how badly I hated Dogville with how cool of an idea that was for a movie to be set up like a stage production or whatever. So I, re I really hate that. He, that like he had that cool idea. And then in my opinion, he fucking just shit the bed. But anyway, that's neither here nor there. Um, so I want to talk about the church elder who, for the for the ninety nine percent of the movie is like a total of shithead asshole. But in this particular scene, Jan's friends, you know, drinking a beer, having a good time. It's the reception or whatever, and he pours some kind of like lemonade concoction. It seems, chugs that down, and then breaks the damn glass with his hand. It's like pretty badass. I don't know. It's a little digression. Yeah, character he's, there. he's I'm he's like I'm a. I'm I'm better than you, young buck. Do they actually call her Dodo in the movie? The sister? I believe that is correct, but it's also her sister in law, correct? It's her it's her brother's sister. Her deceased brother's sister, if I'm not mistaken. Oh, okay. Yeah, because because Dodo is also an outsider. Hmm. Yeah, they have a that. whole they, they they yeah, they mention it multiple times and then and then her and Beth have an old 
whole conversation where Bess is like, you're part of the church and the community and da da da. And, and she's like, yeah, I am, but it doesn't mean I don't have my own thoughts or, or what have you. Something to that effect. Yeah, very interesting character with how she's the voice of reason and her mom just kind of shames Bess throughout the whole thing. Yeah, because while well, Bess has been conditionalized for, like, I don't know, 20, 20 to 25 years, Bess's mom has been conditioned for, I don't know, 50 years. So, yeah, there's way more of that just ingrained in her. All right, so um, getting in a little bit about how um, the sister character expresses how it's just not healthy to obsess as much as she does mentioned that a little while ago but the fact i just want to get in here is how she is you know trying to convince her that her her prayers aren't like directly impacting what's going on around them even though somehow they are fate i guess but in bess's mind this is um, all rubbish so, since so her prayers do come true in a way go ahead so, so how are her, her what are her, what prayers of her are impacting the real world? Are we gonna, are we are we saying that in this movie, Bess praying for Jan to come home led to him having an accident at the oil rig that was directly related and not just a coincidence? All that matters is what Bess thinks. Okay, so the. the to, to her, her they are, okay, I got you. I'm following. Okay, continue. All right. Apparently the first sex scene was supposed to be more traditional. Like they actually like go up to a bedroom or whatever. But um, they ended up throwing in this awkward like bathroom scenario. Um, you know, yeah. Like, so. like he said, cliche. Uh, can't even wait to get to the honeymoon or the bedroom. Having, having, you know, having sex in the dress and all of that, so... The sex is very uncomfortable to watch. Uh, actually, you don't want to see it. You're like, ugh, and stop showing it. You just get plenty of skin. Um, ever been with a partner that acts like that? Um, a very naive Ex um, partner. Oh, just, just not experienced sexually? Yeah, it just acts like she doesn't know what she's doing. Um, I, I mean, I don't, one, I don't, I don't think that, that Bess was acting like she didn't know what she was doing. She was, uh, you know, very no, no, repressed I, and I know, but I'm, I'm just trying to, I'm taking this like from the movie into real life. Have you ever been with a partner that, you know, whether she's doing so out of intention or manipulation, but she's acting like she's, you know, very naive and had sex before. I mean, I never had someone act that way. I mean, obviously, the 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 my first girlfriend was was not my first partner. It was, um, it was her first partner. Um, you know, she you know, hey, I don't know what I'm doing, da 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 da, da kind of stuff. I mean, I didn't really either. Um, so you know, we kind of learned together, kind of thing. But I never I never had anybody act that way for manipulation or to feign purity or any anything like that. All right. So it's definitely like her performance is melodramatic, but instead of, for me, instead of feeling whiny, it feels like has this utter like desperation to it, which makes it really convincing. Oh, she'll, um, so some happenings with, uh, after Jan leaves, she, uh, pretty much waits all afternoon to, uh, talk to him. And of course he's late. Um, well, yeah, I mean, he's working and then she like falls asleep and like someone wakes him up. But, you know, like, I guess that also goes to show like how like destitute maybe or like poor that town is out in the middle of nowhere that there's just a phone booth and not like people don't all have a phone in their home kind of thing. Yep. Shoot. I, I remember whenever I was in college traveling overseas and the only way I could, uh, like video chat with Christina was um, going to like the university and using a MSM messenger. And then I like had to pay the um, cell phone. Um, like you had to pay minutes as you go kind of thing. So yeah. Communication. Yep. Calling your junk a, a brick, uh, very underwhelming sound to it, but there's like you said, there's nothing quite romantic or erotic about this movie, but. Well, like I said, right. At least not to me. 
<laughs> and yeah, I, I, I don't think I would ever, I don't think I'd ever refer to my, to my Johnson, my, my, whatever, you know, uh, my penis as a prick. That's, uh, <laughs> yeah, that's just, I don't, I don't know. That's, that's weird. Mm-hmm. Like I, like I get it. You call someone a prick. It means they're being a dick, but, but still like what the fuck? Yeah. So now we're getting into the part where she believes that since she wished that um, Jan would come home early um, means that he's come home paralyzed and it's it's her fault because the Lord giveth and the Lord taketh. And so she's convinced that this is kind of a monkey's paw wish situation where she got what she wanted, but at a price. And so now he's paralyzed, um, you know, in a hospital bed, miserable. And she feels partially to blame for it. Yeah, she she puts all of that blame on herself because she's like, I couldn't wait. I couldn't wait ten days for him to come home. And yeah, she puts it puts it all on herself. At first, he's just she's just glad that he's alive. You know, doesn't even comprehend the fact that how miserable he's going to be because um, yeah, he wants to feel normal, and you can kind of see him kind of grinning through a few conversations but before too long he he's losing the will to live understandably so as a paraplegic i mean yeah who would who you know i don't think anybody would want to 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 be a paraplegic um or maybe even like uh you know he's hit in the head he's possibly you know possibly quadriplegic um you know kind of thing so yeah that's Hmm. scary and undesirable obviously so then we get to the perversion of this whole thing where he actually requests best to go and sleep with um random partners and for a way for him to be stimulated because he can no longer you know be with her so um so her believing truly in these wedding vows of hers that she must love and abide and respect her husband Uh, feels that it is her religious duty to fulfill this promise that she does not know how to and fakes her way through, but he calls her on it. Asshole. (laughs) Especially since later on he he sends a little note saying, I'm sick in the head, stop listening. (laughs) And she just keeps going. Yeah, and other people are like, this is very perverse. What he's asking of you is wrong. Etc. Etc. And she's like, Nah, I'm gonna just keep fucking doing it. <sighs> but she becomes obsessed and convinced that this condition is his condition is her fault, and being greedy and wanting him back. So she uses her way into being a prostitute as a way of helping divinely heal him, which is crazy, but does end up, you know. Okay, so we can explain is is Jan healing miraculous in any way to you? Okay, so we're we're gonna break this down first. First off, okay. I don't think she ever becomes an actual literal prostitute. I never picked up on that. I know when she goes to the boat the first time and goes to leave, they they say no one will believe a hooker, but I don't think she was there to get money. I think she was there just to do to do the nasty. Um, kind of thing, but do do we think that like like he had a surgery? They showed him having a surgery, and he got better after the surgery, or slightly better. So you know, nothing to do with her um, almost sleeping with her doctor, and then giving a rando the handy J, and then picking up a stranger at the bar. Like none of none of that has anything to do with with what Jess is doing. It's just you know science and medicine yeah just she thinks her conviction matters yes 100 percent, she does okay so you'll notice the doctor in town does not give her the meds as the previous doctor were who, who knows what those were uh she makes advances on the doctor um but he knows she's sick in the head and um gosh the the way she screams whenever he rejects her is is pretty gut-wrenching um, so Jan recovering as wild as he starts, um, starts off just barely being able to write. Yeah, that was, hmm, 
Interesting you brought up the procedure aspect. I I guess I'm kind of... It's shot so like eh in there that it's like you kind of get squeamish about what's actually going on there and maybe you don't actually think it through. Um, and at this point to me, the recovery... Like, obviously I'm not a, a fucking expert in... Uh, mm-hmm. spinal cord and brain injuries and that kind of shit that, you know, like it, it seems like, you know, he's progressing, you know, a, as one would, he had a surgery. It got a little better. It's not really going to get better. They even have that conversation with him a little bit later where they're like, Hey, you need another surgery. And he's like, no, nah, I don't want any more motherfucking surgeries. And, um, and then we'll get to the other part where he does have the miraculous recovery, uh, in a bit. And I'm, I have, yeah, that's the thing. Okay. So as you, so Beth starts, you know, dressing very provocatively because she's turning herself into the town bluesy. You pointed out. I guess I always just kind of implied that she was a prostitute, but I guess I didn't really consider what transaction I mean, maybe, might be maybe, taking place. And, and maybe the people in the town, you know, they're like, "Hey, you're being a prostitute," you know, like, like called her a slut, kind of, you know, calling her a prostitute instead of, you know, necess- like a slut or what have you. You know, either way, not cool, but, um, yeah. I think it's crazy, the the scenes where she's being ridiculed by the children and being called, like, a tart and teased and thrown rocks at. I mean, because, you know, she... Well, this is... In her mind, she's kind of at... Oh, go ahead. I'll say, this is after she's been excommunicated, if my memory serves, so... I mean, it starts a little bit beforehand, and then it gets worse later on. Okay, I guess that's fair. The movie is long, so I might have missed something. But yeah, the, it's pretty repetitive. I just remember the. Yeah, I, I do remember like after she comes back from the big boat and has been excommunicated, she's on the bike and they're just, just follow her like all throughout the town, ridiculing her like the whole time. And she even looks ridiculous on this bike. Like she's like riding it, but then she gets some some rocks, and then she's like trying to move it through the rocks, but can't you know actually ride it anymore. And she's you know not used to being dressed like this, and it's 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 off. It's it's awfully humiliating for her. Yes, for for sure. <sighs> so Bess makes more progress by giving uh, a rando a hand a handy on the on the um the bus. And, um, yeah, people are noticing and judging her, and, you know, we get to endure all that. Uh, Best likely should um, just have been put away, but um, as we do see, she becomes a danger to herself, so that absolutely should have happened. Yeah, yeah the doctor, I mean, he, he definitely made the right call. Like, she definitely needed some help, but I think they, they, they really went about it, the, like, the wrong way. When, once they finally got there and kind of like the surprise where we're going to commit you and you can't do anything about it kind of thing. Let's see. Do you think she switched to turning tricks on the boat for excitement, danger, or being discreet? So I don't, I don't think like, like I said before, I don't think she was necessarily turning a trick and maybe I missed that. Maybe, maybe there was, Maybe there was an implication there that those, you know, if you went to that boat, you were paid to sleep with them. I thought she just went there because those people were either outcast or unscrupulous, and clearly they are unscrupulous once we get on the boat. Um, you know, drugs, guns, alcohol, all that shit. But um, I think I think she was going out there. Maybe it was, you know, hey, I can sleep with these guys, and no one's going to call me the slut because they're not going to know about it kind of thing. But, you know, maybe she also knew that maybe they wouldn't know she was married or whatever, and they would be more likely to go through with these, um, the things that she was going to want to try to do kind of thing. So old, old Udo, Udo's a, he's a, he's a fun one to see in these movies. He's in most of them. Uh, he wants to see some rough, rough sex. He's one of these guys on this big freighter. And, um, yeah, she gets awfully scared whenever another guy starts to, uh, fulfill this fantasy. So she gets the hell out of there. Yeah, and that's, you know, they, they like, attack her. Like, he, he she's like, hey, I want to go home. And then he walks over and, like, cuts the back of her dress. Um, I guess cuts her, too, but cuts the back of her dress. And, you know, she pulls the gun, picks up the gun, and fights her way. And I guess, I guess the old guy on the small boat was there and, you know, took her back to shore. And then, um, you know, she makes her way back to town and, I guess it's Sunday morning. She goes to the church and church is in session and 
they've already warned her that she's about to be excommunicated. And then she, uh, she speaks in, not only does she speak in the church, she speaks during congregation, like interrupting the preacher, the big mm-hmm. bad elder boy. And so they kick her the fuck out. She is 100% excommunicated. They're like, yo, get the fuck out. So, yep. and like, <sighs> mm-hmm. Yeah, and, no, and the town just goes with it because that's what that's all they know. You know, it, it yeah. def, definitely feels like if you ever watched like a period piece movie, like not necessarily specifically The Witch, but like The Witch, you know, like set in that <laughs> kind of time period or era yeah. where someone is cast out of a village kind of thing. That is 100% what that is, except for, you know, it's in the fucking 1970s. <laughs> yeah, and even her mom feels ashamed. Well, of course, I mean. The way she's acting, I mean, who wouldn't be at this point? Um, I mean, I think, I think instead of ashamed, you know, it, 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 but obviously this comes from a different point of thinking and what have you, but like, ob- obviously there should be, we should be trying to help her because now not only does she right. have the, all of the, the mental anguish and issues that she's had previously. And then she has the, she wants her husband back and she, she gets her husband back. But he's hurt, so now it's that life-altering thing where he can't walk, and she's blaming herself, and she has all of this shit going on in her head. And it's like, instead of feeling shame, y'all should fucking help this girl. But, For sure. you know, that's not, yeah. So the critical question, why does she return to the boat? You know, for me, I think she feels like she has no other choice. She's been out, outcasted in so many different ways, and she's convinced that this is going to do something to bring her yawn back. And so she goes for it. Um, and then whenever she comes to, all ripped to shit, um, she's like, did it work? <laughs> so this, this is the point in the movie where any semblance of me actually probably being like, you know what, this wasn't a movie for me, but mm-hmm. I could, you know, I could see its <laughs> merits or what have you. This mm-hmm. this is where it goes out the fucking window. Just one hundred percent. This 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 is where it jumps the shark. Like, I get you know, and especially with how much we've talked about it and such in 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 our conversation here, that obviously she is not right in the head. I fucking get that, but she got attacked and almost fucking you know raped the first time. Why? Why? Literally, for the love of anything holy, would you go back? Like like. It, mm-hmm. even from the sense of she thinks it's going to help yawn, like to me just still that it's, it doesn't make sense. And it's fucking stupid. It, it's like, mm-hmm. well, same thing with, it, um, it, 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 it with, frustrated uh, York not accepting the money to get out of jail. Right. Um, and the dark. I guess. Sure. Yeah. I don't, I, I, I remember, so little of that movie other than, you know, she accidentally <laughs> kills the guy and then she gets hung and we didn't need the, the, the fucking, yeah. Anywho. Yeah. Um, it was just, it was kind of just this big, what the fuck moment. Like Carl and I both literally audibly was said, <laughs> what the fuck is going on here? And then, you know, they thankfully in this movie, he doesn't show us what happens on this boat. Like he would have in some other movies, but mm. We see the aftermath, and she is all fucked up, clearly raped, clearly the shit beaten out of her, stabbed, cut, bruised, all of this shit. And Mm. the doctors also, like, they may be in a bigger town. They're still in the fucking backwoods because instead of her being fucking gassed out or, you know, knocked out or whatever, she's screaming to see Jan. And before they move surgery on her, they're like, we're going to show her to Jan. Show Jan to her. And it's like, bro, no fucking fucking sedate her and do what you got to do and then they let her start mm-hmm. talking to her fucking mom and then they're like oh look she fucking died well no shit because y'all were fucking stupid hmm. so the doctor is basically interviewed about you know what happened in the situation and he just says you know she um she died because she was good she died for her convictions or so forth um she was acting under good yeah, intentions and- Yes, that she was doing morally questionable things by their scale under good intentions, also mm-hmm. by their scale. <laughs> um, What's the parable with, about good intentions? I forget. <laughs> mm-hmm. It's um, not there. 
<laughs> yeah, it's um also I would like to point out that this this is the part of the movie um where that I, I equate to, to the end of Dancer in the Dark. We don't need she dies, we literally don't need anything else after this. Like the, the movie could end right there and it's the same function, the same thing, same everything. And we don't get this dumb fucking moment they're about to talk about. So they show the little trial or whatever. And the doctor Oh, I'm not even talking about the one thing. I like so they the doctor, you know, says his thing or whatever, and then they that you you see them talking to the elders about trying to get her these burial rites and shit. And all of a sudden, Jan is mysteriously fucking walking. And it's like, "Bro, what the literal fuck? You said you weren't going to have a surgery. Now you had a surgery, and it's worked so well that in the couple of days since Best died, you can walk with the like the fucking crutches that wrap around your arms what the fuck my god oh my god it's so oh my god why like it makes no sense no sense no sense just just no sense oh my god we wouldn't have had that and we wouldn't have had this other thing that you're going to talk about, and I'll say some stuff about afterwards or whatever. But like, oh my god, it just oh, oh my god. Lars von Trier's big f you to the audience that there's a god. <sighs> um, all right, yeah. So the uh, the elders are assholes. So um, Jan decides to uh, you know, dump her off at sea, a little Viking uh, funeral. And then we get a little uh, fantastical realism as the uh, her carcass, I guess, floats down into the water. Heaven's bells apparently start to chime, and we the camera, you know, goes off into the clouds, and you know we see these bells, you know, the bells that these you know. hmm? the bells that what. Oh, the bells that she, um, you know, she was wanting from the beginning. She finally delivered Those on Those one differous 1990 CGI bells that were... Okay. They looked so fucking terrible. And again, so fucking dumb. Oh, my God. And I get that they wanted to tie back to the bells, and it's like an angel getting her wings or whatever, or, or, or you know, the bells trying to... Sainthood, a martyr, so or whatever. Yeah, what, whatever. Well, that makes it a happy so you're ending. Familiar, you're, you're familiar with The Undertaker, correct? Yeah. Okay, and you're familiar with his eye roll where he rolls his eyes in the back of his head? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> so when that happened, I put him to shame, okay? That is, oh my God. Happy happy ending there was the only thing that was happy about the ending was that it was the actual end because again let me get up organ until music. that point where she, where she gets back to the boat where she goes back to the boat like it the movie was not for me like it wasn't great but it you know like mm -hmm. I, i'd be like you know it wasn't for me and then she goes back to the boat and all of this other fucking shit and this movie has taken such a ridiculous turn it's such a ridiculous turn. The first time I watched it, I was so like taken aback by it, like having that like blatant proof of or whatever the film is arguing at some points. Because maybe I thought it was more of like an argument the first time I watched it, and so um, yeah, that was that it was kind of a miraculous thing to see in a movie. It was quite taking aback. Felt the same way the second time, but this this last time, I would say. It does kind of have a cheese factor, um, especially when you're taking more into account um, her as a sick woman. So, um, so revisiting this, I would say I really, really enjoyed it all time. Uh, every time I've gone back to it, um, and I'm still quite intrigued by its themes and ideas. Um, the slow emotional road of a movie it is. I've always been able to connect with Bess's point of view, especially since the film pays off pays off that perspective making her a tragic hero so um but under the surface Lars also makes us her her look uh ridiculous which I did key into more this time like I was talking about with 
Um, it's a story that makes us fall for this good-natured, deluded person and then destroys them in front of us, do their convictions and being cast out. Such a crazy twist of an idea of marriage, vows, commitment, sex, religion, life. It is a twist, and I'm not. I will not say a crazy twist. To me, to this extreme, in in this, it this extreme, that is just a fucking toxic twist. Very not crazy, but toxic. Just my thoughts, and I know. Well, I can appreciate that. I know. Yeah, I know what you're gonna give it. I know, and I'm pretty sure that the the the, the listeners here can can guess what you're about to give this movie. Yes, I. I, I think it's the same. Still, I think it's the same it's thing you've given all the me. all the L. Yeah, I think it's the same thing you've given no. all of the LVT movies. No, no? the idiots has a firm half star rating. Okay, fair. Oh, all the ones that we have done at least. Well, could we both hate watch the idiots together? Is the question. No, please God, no. Like if, <laughs> like if it is so. Re- okay, so do you hate Offensive. it because it's not like the rest of these movies? I hate it because it promotes the mindset that slackers, um, by being slack and a hindrance on society, you're in some way making a contribution. Um, it's a lot deeper than that, but it it's a really, really bad theme that it, I just personally despise. Okay. Um... Nothing in that that you told me makes me think that I would also like it, or it makes me think <laughs> I would also hate it, and I don't know why we would do that to ourselves. So when okay. I sat down and just wrote my review, just threw it out there. <laughs> yeah, I see what you're trying to do. You tried to sneak that sneak that in. Um, I will like to point out before I go in further. It just came back to this. So at the beginning, you mentioned that you know we say goodbye to, to Von Trier. Like you want to bring someone else on, and you want to talk about Von Trier, or you want to do it in your spinoff, or do go. Do whatever the fuck you want. Please just don't ask me to watch any more of his movies. I beg you. I just, it doesn't. Him, I don't vibe with him. I don't vibe with Lynch. It's just, it's not my thing. And I get it. That probably, you know. But there's melancholia. Okay, and? The house that Jack built. And? Where Matt Dillon acts as a serial killer who with OCD, and it's, it's quite hilarious. And he um, goes to hell. Well, I mean, okay, that's you know, if he's a serial killer, that's where he belongs. Um, I will say, as I sat down to write this review and give it a star rating, that I had it, I had it as a two. And then I thought about it, and again, everything that happened once we got back to the boat just fucking <laughs> ruined anything that it had. So I, I definitely, I put it. I put it at a one. Like, I I don't foresee myself ever recommending this movie to anybody, wanting to rewatch it myself. Like, it it just, it did nothing for me. Like I said, thankfully, he didn't, we didn't see, like, 87 rape scenes, like in Dogville and Dancer in the Dark and all of that kind of stuff. But, yeah, his his style, it's not for me. And, like, to, to the point of, like, Kubrick is not for me, but I can at least recognize like, hey, he's doing things here that are good and what have you. Mm-hmm. And like his style doesn't vibe with me because it's like me and Carl were talking. It's very clinical. And clearly all the things that I like are typically big and over the top and what have you. But I, I don't know what it is about LVT, but he just does not. How he makes movies doesn't vibe with me. So that's just like to, like to me, he is a not a good director. Because I, I don't find I, I can't even go, oh, look, there's good cinematography or good dialogue because like none of it resonates with me. So like. I'm sure that, you know, there are people who are listening to this who are like, man, Joey, you're fucking stupid. And that's fine. That's that's fine. That's that's OK. And there are people no. who, you know, resonate with him like you do. So also fine. I would just and I, and I would say your audience is probably your side of it would probably be the larger majority. But um, I mean, I don't think the larger majority normally gets to this kind of stuff. So it's fun to mix it up and see, you know, what each other think of these kind of things. It's kind of how we, we started this whole shindig. It is. And like, you know, 
the the first season especially was was rough. We didn't, you know, even though we had been friends for a while and we both knew we liked movies, we didn't really, outside of a handful of movies, really know what the other person liked a ton. Mm-hmm. Um, and like I feel like, like I said last time on and and on the last episode, and even when we were discussing, you know, like DMing each other going into this one, like you had to know that I probably wasn't going to like this one. Like I I wanted like I was like okay, we're gonna go into this, we're gonna give this like a real shot, like. And it just it just didn't hit for me. So like, and it's interesting because this one actually had a history on the show because I think I would mention it um, you, periodically. You had talked about it. You and had, I described the plot, and you'd be like, "Oh," and you're like, "Oh, that's like kind of sounds intriguing." So, <laughs> uh, and like reading like and like when you said what it was, and like I went and read it like on Letterbox, like it it the way it is described, it does sound interesting. But I don't, I don't remember if on Letterbox it had the the crazy religious overtures to it, mm-hmm. um, and I and I think that. So yeah, like I, I don't know. He's just he's just like I said, he's not my cup of tea, and that's fine. He's not. There are plenty of things that I'm sure that we have talked about or watched on here that a lot of people are like, yo, that's not my cup of tea. I'm sure there are people who are listening to me. Um, but well, both of us, but me specifically, because I'm you know bashing this movie, but me praising like stuff like Scott Pilgrim and they're like, Oh, well, you know, you just don't understand film or whatever. And it's like, well, I mean, maybe I don't shit. I'm, I, I'm not a bit scolded and I'm just a guy who likes to watch, you know, movies shit. Mm -hmm. Um, so, well, actually now that I think about it, like, I think this has been one of our best, like back and forths about how we feel about, you know, a show and like, you know, in the first couple seasons, like we would go at it and, you know, like sometimes, you know, you just kind of, you know, you'd had enough. Or whatever but i think with like playing in the last couple seasons we've played with a lot of movies that we both really enjoyed and i think we've kind of developed our craft and now dipping back into these more challenging movies i think we're more kind of um better um podcasters in the long run so i mean i i think so but also like i i think it, at least from the conversation side of this with this being such there's so much of a religious overture to this and we have such varying opinions, maybe not Mm -hmm. as varying as they were when we started, but definitely varying opinions, at least from that side, there is perspective. And, you know, I can say, you know, like I didn't like this movie and I can tell you why. And it's, it's not just like, Oh, it was boring or Mm -hmm. I didn't like this character or, you know, X, Y, Z. Like there's, you know, there's like, this is my perspective and like, this is why this movie doesn't grab me. And if you go back through our history, like when we did like The Omen, um, or if you, I don't know if we've talked about it on cast. I know you and I have talked about it off cast, like when I watched The Exorcist, like, and any of those kind of like mm-hmm, mm-hmm. religious horror movies, like they don't do fucking shit for me because the, the thing that's supposed to scare you, the demons and Satan and all of that, like it doesn't have, it doesn't have that hold on me kind of thing. So, it doesn't have any you know, coming into... Yeah, and so you come into this movie where, and then there's no demons and you know possession and that kind of stuff, but there is, um, you know, that old the 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 you know the 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 religious zealism zealism is not a word, but um, fanaticism almost um of of you know the zealots. small town, mm-hmm. yeah they they are zealots yes um, and how it, it how it has impacted this one girl Bess and. You know, it, and it, you know, it points to the kind of things we're still dealing dealing with today, and um, with there's a bunch of just old, old, old white dudes that are out of touch running shit. But that's a different thing. But um, so yeah, it's like if we had watched this in season one or two, would we've had this kind of conversation? Probably not, honestly. Like, um. And I also I think part of it in season one is we just hit this long like row of movies in a row where it was a bunch of movies that I did want to see. And I don't know if I would have watched them. I had watched all of them in, even though we didn't watch them in like, like back to back to back to back. You know, mm-hmm. we had space in between them, but I wouldn't have, you know, went from watching like ashes and diamonds into like, I, let's, you know, into in Bruges, into Kronos, into, I want to talk, let's talk about Kevin, you know, <laughs> with all of them. And some of those yeah. are your movies, but you know, where they, um, but you know, like I, I didn't know what the fuck I was getting myself into when I, when I picked, um, oh shit, what's that movie with Naomi Watts, um, Mulholland Drive, like, oh yeah, I didn't know what the fuck, <laughs> I, I didn't know what the fuck I was getting myself into with that, like at all, and like, 
And like, oh, you know, there is a part of me that goes, you know, hey, maybe, maybe I should rewatch that now. Maybe I would have some different perspective on it, but I just disliked it and was like so disoriented by it that I get just I'm just like, nah, I don't I don't really want to like retackle that. But um, but yeah, I think like you said, it's just uh, we're 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 better speaking with each other um, and like we both know how to prompt the other person to have better responses, I think. Um, so like, hopefully even if you necessarily didn't agree with everything we had to say audience, that you at least enjoyed the, the conversation because I'm sure it made for a lot better podcast than when we did the, than the part where we talked about dancer in the dark or when we talked about some of that stuff in season one that just did not resonate, <laughs> resonate mm-hmm. with me. So cool. Cool. Best part of the show. What's coming up next? What is coming up next? What you got for us, Justin? Let me go first. All right. So this is a movie that I was indifferent to the first time I watched it. I thought it was okay. And then I rewatched it on a 4th of July. And like for a while there, I had like this tradition of watching war movies on the 4th of July. Oh, this was a stinker. Um... This is Michael Cimino's The Deer Hunter we're going to be watching. It won an Oscar. It was like the first Vietnam movie to win. Um, like it, it, it was the first Vietnam movie to like really expose, like I guess, uh, soldiers' trauma from that war. Okay. But Cimino tells it in such a kind of melodramatic, drawn-out, cliche way that despite it having... A really nice look to it i think you know the core of it it's kind of not much substance there and very cliche and unfulfilling but i've had many many arguments with people on letter books uh, letterbox about this movie thinking that i'm absolutely out of my mind that i think it's overrated but um hey let's let's watch it and see what you think so two things so one do you think it's overrated or, or that it's cliched now but maybe wasn't cliched when it came out like it's cliched now because we've seen so many other things do it but at the time was it like something that was like new and groundbreaking i mean not necessarily groundbreaking but i mean do you know have you ever heard of the um christopher walken scene where he's uh, they're playing russian roulette it's him and um i think it's de niro yeah de niro and um Christopher Walken doing um, Russian Roulette. Does that ring a bell? It does not. Okay. It's... I... It's... Chimino has always been one of these directors I've complained about most. Um, I just recently revisited um, Heaven's Gate and kind of had did a whole other analysis on how I feel about his writing and his... Over, his... He, he does really, really good on production design and does beautiful sceneries and compelling scenes, but I just think that shitty writing at the core of it. So, um, yeah. Um, did that answer your question? <laughs> sure. And the second thing I want to say before I go into to my pick is that, so I was going... I was I was going through the Google Doc here and I was making my little my little highlights so you know you could be prepared for which things I was going to have things to say on or what have you and uh, I was like ooh it's Justin's pick and uh, I never look for the record I do like I I do never look but uh, Carl was like ooh let me see so you know I handed my laptop and he uh, you know he looked at it and he was like oh man like this is like a highly acclaimed movie and it's like but Justin gave it like two and a half stars or whatever and it's like well Jesus Christ like just like as we've talked about before to like to you a two and a half is like like a one to me almost (laughs) like so i was just like oh shit like i and i had no no clue what the hell it could be so um and i think we're gonna have a very uh another super juxtaposed um episode because i'm keeping it very light more popcorn (laughs) fair um not a three-hour vietnam epic (laughs) No, no, it is with Meryl Streep. Maybe an hour to, and an hour, an hour long hour. wedding scene. It has an hour long wedding scene. Welcome to Michael Cimino. 
Justin, you 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 know what's gonna happen on the next episode. I'm going to be like Justin. Why the fuck did you make me watch a goddamn hour long marriage scene? You could have at least, if you were to make me watch something that was an hour long that didn't need to be an hour long, it could have been Al Pacino in the biggest bathtub I've ever seen before he snorts 37 pounds of cocaine. Scarface? Yeah, that's the one. But anyhow, so to go along with our three-hour Vietnam epic, um, I did I did cheat a little bit on my... Uh, my quote, my quote did not come from an actor or actress in this movie. It actually came because this movie is featured within this movie, and that is Pitch Perfect. <laughs> nice. Yep, I, am, I am staying very musically on theme, and it does look like uh, that you have seen this movie, but not in the Letterboxd era, because it does not have a review or a star rating. Oh, wow. So, yeah. I think I've reviewed Pitch Perfect 3. Huh. Okay. <laughs> oh, well, well. <laughs> I've only seen that one once because it did not not hit quite the same. But one and two, I am very very fond of. Actually, fun fact about Pitch Perfect two, um, it is the highest grossing musical of all time, or at least it was right after it came out. It could have been eclipsed by now. But even Anna Kendrick herself is like, this isn't a musical movie. This is a movie about music because a musical, I'm sure as we've discussed, is you know, La La Land or. Um, you know, we're, uh, umbrellas, something where the music in the, the song is the plot, not just these are characters who sing. So, but it should be a, a an interesting and, and fun episode. Very, um, interesting. They, they so next time together. we're going to start with the, uh, the crazy one. So, all right, let's fucking do it. And if you would like to us to answer a question on this show, perhaps. Just send us an email. You know, reach out via social media. We're here. We'll listen. Contact us. Yeah, we, we sure. Why we not? would love to hear from you. We 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 would like suggestions, thoughts, comments, ideas. Um, I mean, isn't that how um Ronan got on to an episode and a couple episodes with you was? Yep. By reaching yep. out and um, yep. Friend of the someone show, reached Ronan. out and that's and that's how we watched um. It was with Stalingrad and um, yeah. Oh, we watched Stalingrad to go with what Enemy at the Gates and uh, Falcon, not the Millennium Falcon, but the Falcon, the Maltese the Falcon, fucking Maltese Falcon. There we go, that one. I do remember I that we want we brought um, well with Adam when Adam came on we watched. Um, don't tell me. Nightcrawler for sure, and Blue Valentine. So okay, that was so that, those we watched with with Adam. Okay, that was our our movie second buddy, guest one of your episode. Favorite actors. Yeah, that mm-hmm. was that was a hell of a good episode. That was um, also Blue Valentine, bro. What a fucking mm, that was that was a rough one. I mean, it was good, but it was it was rough emotionally. And then our first guest episode was Ben, and we did Last Jedi and Rumblefish. Yep. We had Paul on, and we did... Um, Inherent Vice, mm-hmm. and... What was the other one? Yeah, I don't... I, I mean, I can go to the list. You give me a second, but... Sure. Uh, the archive for our channel, and let's see where the question is. All right, so there's the one we were just talking about. Where's inherent uh, inherent vice and Jackie? Oh yeah, and it was the that That's was the episode one. right after the enemy at the gate, Stalingrad, Maltese Falcon. We didn't have a guest, but we watched. Stalingrad at the because someone Request, someone suggested yeah. it, yeah, requested through an email. So yeah. Oh, gotcha. Now it's all coming together. Yeah. So. Hmm. 
Five years now. Yeah, dude. It's crazy. It's crazy how many episodes we've done and how many how many movies we've done. It's crazy how I started Letterbox before that. <sighs> yeah. I still get the when in, over the summer I am sure I'll get the notification from where uh where like I started talking about being on where, where you you were in the comments of some movie and you were like here go to Letterbox and then it's like yeah, and I talked about how I spent like two days logging like all the movies that I had seen at the time, which was like less than a thousand, and I'm slowly closing in on two thousand now. All right, so I'm thinking of a movie from def it's probably season one. You can ask okay. me like questions about it to figure out what it is. Okay. Okay, just any, um, was it, whose movie was it? Was it your movie or my movie? Like, I think it was a challenge movie. It was a challenge movie. Did I lament the fact that you challenged me to it? I think you did end up not enjoying it nearly as much as I was expecting. Okay. In the knife, then was I find out your deep dark history with um, uh, Tony Montana. Tony Montana. Was it Lahin? Yep, that's that's the movie. Mm, the Bret Hart poster in the beginning. Mm hmm. <sighs> you want to throw one at me? All right, all right. Let's see. Season one. Okay. Boy, howdy. We <laughs> did a lot of movies in season one. 40 of them, right? Yeah, 40. Well, actually, 40, 42. <laughs> just because we want to go just a little extra. Yeah, we wanted to be a little extra. Um... Let's see. It is a movie that ended up being one of my favorite movies. Not like in my top four. You know what? All right. Uh, yeah, there's a few. You, you can try to guess from there. Go for it. This ended up being a favorite movie. Mm -hmm. Is this a comedy? Uh, technically, yes. Yes, it is a comedy. Is this a Coen Brothers film? Yes. Is this Fargo? Yeah, it's Fargo. I didn't really know which one I was going to pick, and you immediately just picked one. Because I looked, and I was like, ooh, there's this one, and this one, and this one. And then I was like, oh, yeah, also this one. So there's like, dude. Yeah, there's like four. Like, I lament on that season, because there's all these movies that I just didn't like. But there's like four... Four movies that I had never seen that ended up being some of my all-time favorite movies. Would you like to go another so, round? All right, sure. Hit me. Or I guess I should ask you a question. Um, is this... Oh, was it a challenge movie? No. So it was an actual movie. Was it your movie or my movie? I chose it. You you chose it for me or it was on your list? This is this was during an era where we could come up with what we wanted to for a category. Okay, so now we are in season two. Okay. Hmm. How much did I hate this movie? I think you were indifferent to it. Indifferent. Did it have to do with a boutique movie label? 
Yes. Bring me the head of Alfredo Garcia. Oh, okay. That, that you were asking if that was the category. Um, this movie definitely has a high presence in the Criterion Collection. But um, sorry, I led you on the right the wrong, the wrong track there. Okay, it has a high presence on the, the Criterion Collection, and I'm indifferent towards it. The Gamora. No. Shay, Shay Part Two, specifically. No. Well, maybe ask broader questions. Uh, there's only one other thing that has to do with the the Criterion Collection. Well, there's two more that I know of, and I liked all of them, so I'm a little confused. Um. Um, there, it's a French film. Mmm, French. Maybe we're not in season two. Maybe we are in season three. What season is it? Um, shit. I'm I I'm looking at it based on um. I guess I can. Uh, friend. Oh, I have. Uh, I got a mute. Maybe it's the season audio. one. Is it Army of Shadows? And it slowly loads. Although that would have been when we didn't pick whatever we wanted, so that doesn't make sense either. Um, well, that's not that. Season, I fucking hated yes, that. Yeah, season two. I didn't like that. And... Okay. Well, we're not... That's in the season three, so it's, it was I guess, French. Mm -hmm. The Red, White, and Blue trilogy? Well, yeah, part of that. Oh, I liked all of those movies. Uh, Red, Blue, White, one of them, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> the one I thought you were mad towards was White, which is what I picked. Okay. Which is my second. Which favorite. I mean, okay, fair enough. Um, hmm. Let's see. Let me find one. Okay. And uh, we can get you around two. All right, I got it. Ask away. Okay. Is this a foreign film? No. Or if it if it is, it's not in a foreign language. Okay. Did I pick it or did you? I picked it. We should have been prepared with like game show music. <laughs> you add it and add it in post. Oh, I'm too lazy. <laughs> I do it on the fly. Okay, um, you said you picked it, and it's what? What was the country of origin? You asked if it was uh, the country of origin. It's not what you asked. You asked if it was foreign. It is in English, and it definitely looks like it is a British movie. Okay, which I did not know that until I just looked at it. Is this movie? Um, Smoke and Aces. We haven't watched Smoke and Aces. We haven't? No. <laughs> it, was the, it was worth a shot, right? <laughs> <laughs> so we haven't watched that on, I don't think I've watched that in years, fam. You, you are talking about the mobster movie with like Jeremy Piven and... Uh, Alicia Keys and Ben Affleck and God knows who the fuck else. Sounds right. Yeah, no, we haven't watched that. Hmm. Okay. Um, it's an English movie. And what was that? What was the other clue you gave me? 
that I picked it. That you picked. English movie that you picked. Okay. Is it crime? There is crime involved, yes. Okay. Is this from your favorite genre, noir? No. Okay. Is this an intense action movie? Also, no. Hmm. Justin is so confused right now. So many. Um, crime. What was the, um, was there a category that surrounded this film? Hmm, was there? That's a good question. Um, I don't believe there was an actual category. It's not I rock think and roll, is... is it? No, it is not rock and roll. Rock and, and that's what I that's the rock... one I got confused with smoke and aces. Oh okay, yeah, no, it is not rock and roll. But yeah, this is well, hold 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 before I accidentally lie to you. Let me make sure. Okay. That we weren't Yeah, I don't think yeah, I think at this point, I yeah, I don't think there's a category. If there is, I don't remember it, and I apologize. It's not a horror movie, is it? It is not a horror movie. It's a mystery. Um, I think technically, yes. It doesn't have it listed, but I would, I, I guess it isn't a mystery because we know the whole time, but I think it would, it's in that vein, I guess, to a degree. So are we talking about Knives Out? No, it's not Knives Out. Mike wouldn't pick that. You hated that movie. True. For some reason. <laughs> um... Not old guard, is it? No, that is an action movie. Um, let's see. It. I'll give you a hint. Okay. Its genres. I will give you its genres according to Letterbox. Okay. Romance, crime, thriller, drama. Is it Crash? It is not Crash. <laughs> Man, that was. I don't think perfect. we did. We did. Oh, we did do Crash because it was part of the that episode. That Two. that had a theme. <laughs> yes, so, it did. A four movie episode. Uh, Ronan was a big action crime movie. Yep, but also it had a theme. You want to come after after that? After the theme era. Yeah, it's after the theme era. Okay, what season should I narrow down to? Uh, three. Okay. At least I'm pretty sure it's three. Uh, if it's not three, I think it's three. It might be four, but because I don't remember what was technically the end of season three. I remember the end of season one and two, but it's not a horror movie. It's not a horror movie. What, did I ask about comedy? You didn't, but I gave you the genres. Oh. Repeat. Hold up. Do, 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 do. Uh, romance, crime, thriller, drama. Riveting radio. It is riveting radio. <laughs> um, is it uh, from Russia with love? 
It is not from Russia with love. Oh man. <sighs> um, maybe ask. I don't know. Maybe maybe take a stab at trying to think of a director or an actor or actress. Maybe that will help you narrow it down. All right, what's up? What's the lead of this film? Who's the lead? Um, <laughs> the lead is a male. According to Letterbox, the lead is a male. I would argue the lead is a female. Uh, is it Christine? No, that's a horror movie. This is okay. I give up. You win. It is Match Point. Oh, huh. Yeah, that's right. which makes sense that it's British. It takes place in England, but yeah, mm. Jonathan Reese Myers is the the actual lead according to Letterbox, and then ScarJo. And I would argue that ScarJo is the lead. I was hoping, like you asked when. If there oh, was I a picked genre. Seven Year Itch, and you picked Match Point. Yeah, and we came up with a. We accidentally, you know, we didn't make a theme, but it was like, oh, look, we got the the old school blonde bom- Hollywood bombshell and the new school Hollywood blonde bombshell. Yeah. Wild. And I guess now it's Anya, but. So, Joy, why do we do this show? Because we fucking love talking about movies. Unless they're directed by Lars von Trier. And then only Justin does. Cheers. Night. Peace. Cool.